Hi everyone, so we're back with another video. This video is going to be the first part of several in the series that we're talking about the nervous system. This one we're looking at the neuron and the nervous system divisions. Um, and so just please make sure you understand what's in this video so when we put out the other ones then it'll be easier to understand. So in this lecture series I have the other Dr. V with me. Um, he knows quite a bit about the nervous system, so he will be assisting. Okay, so the nervous system controls everything about you, whether it's an organ on the inside, like your heart or your lungs, your brain, um, as well as the spinal cord will send divisions to regulate it. Or this one, this guy, he makes me laugh. Um, you see how his, his cheeks and eyes and just everything about him is just the muscles are contracting that's also controlled by your nervous system so how you walk you speak when you chew everything about you whether it's voluntary or involuntary is controlled by your nervous system all right so first we're going to start off with a, a very important cell that we see primarily in the nervous system and that is the neuron or the nerve cell okay so this is showing you the anatomy of the neuron, and I'm going to have the other Dr. V talk about it. Okay, so here we have the nerve cell, like Dr. V said, it's called a neuron. And this basically controls the movement of information. You have neurons that are important for detecting a stimulus. And then you have certain neurons that are just there to integrate information. And so what you're looking at here, anatomically, are several portions of a nerve cell that are critical for the movement of that information. You see the dendrite. The dendrite is a portion of that nerve cell that receives sensory information. Then you have the cell body that contains the nucleus. And that information travels through the cell body and then on through the axon. That axon is going to send that information somewhere. Okay, so what we have here is we have specific nerve cells considered motor and sensory. Sensory nerve cells will send information to the brain through the spinal cord. And these are called afferent nerves. Motor nerves will take nerve signals from the brain through the spinal cord to some effector organ, like a muscle or organ. All right? So those are the two types of general types of nerve cells and the types of information that they carry. Okay. So just one important note to say here is that the axon, not all neurons actually have this on there, but most of them do, have a sheath that surrounds it called a myelin sheath. Um, it's more of like a fatty-like substance that covers it, and there are gaps in between the myelin sheath that are called nodes of Ranvier. Now, it's important to have these sheaths around it because it will allow rapid transmission of signal. We'll talk about that a little later called saltatory conduction. Um, if there is, let's say, a neuron that has degradation in the myelin sheath, it can lead to disorders of that, like what we see with multiple sclerosis, amongst others. Um, so just to let you know, we, just to recap, we have the cell body that has the nucleus, we have the axon, and we have the axon terminal ends. And then the axon, for some, is covered by a myelin sheath. Again, here we have a different perspective or a different diagram of how the motor and sensory nerves function. So if you look at the sensory section of this uh, picture, we see that this particular nerve is carrying some stimulus or sensory information from the skin and it's going to the spinal cord and then to the brain. Okay, so that would be called sensory information or an afferent nerve pathway. The next one is the motor neuronal pathway. And you can see here that it starts in the brain, it goes through the spinal cord, and then to some effector organ. Here we have a muscle. And so the brain is basically sending signals to the effector to basically control what happens with that muscle. 
So we have different types of neurons outside of just being mo uh, motor versus sensory. Um, we have general classification of, of neurons. First, we have the axonomic neurons, which pretty much don't have an axon or a defined axon. Then we have the bipolar neurons. We have the unipolar and the multipolar. Now, they're based on how their cell body looks and how they're attached to the axon if there is one present. So since we are talking about motor neurons and um, sensory neurons, um, we have the motor neurons being more multipolar in nature where the sensory can be uni or bipolar. But there's also another neuron called the interneuron. Do you want to talk about that, Dr. V? Uh, interneurons are specialized in taking the stimuli or the sensory information and integrating what that stimuli uh, represents. And that helps the motor nerves figure out what types of signals need to be sent to the effector organs. When we, want, when we talk about these four different nerves, I want to point out something unique about the bipolar neuron. And these neurons are generally found in the extra special sensory areas like vision, smell, taste. All the sensory information or sensory portions of the brain have a lot of these bipolar neurons. Okay, so outside of the neuron, we have other types of cells, supporting cells. We call them neuroglia. And based on which system they belong to, and I'll talk about in a little bit more about the central versus peripheral. Um, in the central nervous system, where we find more of the brain and spinal cord, we have a series of cells that we'll talk about, as well as in the peripheral. So I will let Dr. V talk about the epidemal cells. Okay, so the first category of the microglial cells or neuroglial cells is the ependymal cells. And these cells are found in the brain and they specialize in making cerebral spinal fluid. These are cells that generate the fluid that circulates throughout the ventricles of the brain. It bathes the brain, protects the brain, and helps nourish the brain. The astrocytes are actually very, very critical. These are termed the glue that holds all the other cells together. It keeps them all in close proximity. It supports the brain and other cell types, and it is, it's called the glue of the brain. The microglial cells are the immune cells of the brain. The brain is so important that it has basically its own immunity, and these cells go around patrolling brain tissue and the fluids, making sure that there's nothing there that's not supposed to be there. The fourth type of cell in the central nervous system is the oligodendrocytes. Dr. V talked about the myelin in a previous slide. It's a lipid substance, and it's very important for nerve transmission. And in the central nerves, the oligodendrocytes are what generate the myelin. Now, when we talk about the peripheral nerves, the sister to the oligodendrocyte cell are the Schwann cells. The Schwann cells generate the myelin for peripheral nerves. There's an important distinction between the two, and scientists really don't know why the fact that central nerves cannot regenerate, but peripheral nerves can. And it all hinges on why Schwann cells can reproduce the lipid layers and the oligodendrocytes on the nerves that are damaged cannot. All right, so peripheral nerves can regain functionality even when there's damage, whereas the central nerves can't. Now, the satellite cells are unique cells. These are cells that are actually precursors for skeletal muscle cells, and it allows for the multinucleated cells to form Okay, so that was that was really informative. Now you keep hearing us say uh, central nervous system and peripheral nervous system, like neuroglia of the central nervous system and neuroglia of the peripheral nervous system. Well, there are two general branches of the nervous system. The first one, I'll start on this side, is the central nervous system that consists of 
the brain and the spinal cord. So it's more central. That's a good way to remember it. Brain and spinal, um, spinal cord. Everything else outside of that is considered peripheral. All right, so the peripheral can consist of other types of nerves like the cranial nerves, the spinal nerves, which I'll talk about them later. But there's another term called ganglia. And I'll have Dr. V talk about what is a ganglia. So we see this term here. Okay, so ganglia, don't be too nervous about that word. A ganglia is just a collection of cell bodies from different nerves. And they form different regions where information collects. And then the, the determination of where that information goes is handled by those ganglia. This is just um, an overview introduction of the brain, which is a part of the central nervous system. We'll have another video kind of giving more detail regarding um, the structures of the central nervous system. But it's just showing the three general parts. The biggest part of the brain is called the cerebrum. Um, there are multiple lobes that are associated with that. Then we have our cere cerebellum. And we have our brainstem, which is consistent of multiple parts, like the medulla oblongata. Um, there is a very important structure in the brain um, called the hypothalamus. It's actually um, quite significant, and it plays a huge role, especially in the endocrine system as well. Um, the diencephalon includes the hypothalamus and the thalamus. Now there, we also have fissures in the brain, as well as cell size and gyrides. All right, so this is showing you a cross-section of the spinal cord. Remember, the spinal cord belongs to the central nervous system just like the brain. And this cross-section means like I'm just chopping it down the middle. Now, if you take a look here, you see that there are lighter portions and then there are dark, darker portions. The lighter portions um, has what's called white matter. And the darker portions are called gray matter. And the reason why they're given that name is the appearance based on its myelination, the myelination of the axons. Um, we do have divisions, branches that come out of the actual um, spinal cord called roots. Right? We have a dorsal root and we have a ventral root. Here we have um, cells, horn cells on the inside of this region right here. Do you want to say anything else about this? Sure. So what I'm going to point out here is when we're talking about the gray matter, this section up top is known as the dorsal root. All right. And here we have the dorsal horn. And down here we have the ventral horn. What's unique about each of these divisions is that the dorsal horn carries or receives sensory information, whereas the ventral horn sends motor information from the spinal cord. So sensory information comes into the spinal cord through the dorsal horn, and motor information leaves the ventral horn and goes to effector organs and glands. Right. So when we talk about certain disorders like polio, the virus actually likes to destroy the ventral or anterior horn cells, which leaves people kind of with paralysis. That's why we see that kind of dysfunction going on. So I was just saying that as an example. All right, so the spinal nerves um, are actually a formation when the roots come together. The spinal nerve actually is not a part of the central, it's a part of the peripheral because now it's outside of the spinal cord. This is just showing you another picture of it. And I'm going to talk about these three structures that you see here, pia mater, arachnoid mater, and dura mater. I'm going to talk about those a little bit later. But these are just two of similar pictures that I just wanted to show you. Okay, so once again, here's the brain, here's the spinal cord. But remember those three layers that I was talking about? The central nerve, um, central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, has a very protective um has a lot of protection around it, I should say. Um, one of the most important protectors that we see here outside of the cerebral spinal fluid is are, is the three structures you see here. We have the dura mater, arachnoid, and pia mater. They're part of the meninges. They make up the meninges. Very tough, 
Um, it's connected and it will prevent infections and prevent other things from going through. If you do have inflammation in the meninges, that is called meningitis, but it covers the spinal cord as well as the brain. You may have heard the term the blood-brain barrier. Um, if you've ever heard that before, the three meningeal layers are, are central to that barrier. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that the spinal nerves and the cranial nerves are part of the peripheral. Um, in another video, I'll talk more about the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. But just to let you know, the cranial nerves, we do have 12 of them. And they are, they are branched out of the actual central nervous system, but it's not central nerves. It's actual peripheral nerves. So we have them up here um, listed in order. We have the olfactory, optic, ocular motor neurons. We have trochlear, trigeminal, abducens, facial, vestibular cochlear, glossopharyngeal, vagus, accessory, and hypoglossal nerves. These are showing you where they're originating from, from the brain. And this diagram here is just showing you what they regulate. Example, olfactory plays a role in, in smelling optic and vision, ocular motor, trochlear and abducens play a role in eye movement, but ocular motor has some divisions associated with it um, that allows it to do various things. I, I'm going to kind of skip over some of these. Facial nerves is, is actually very important when we see people that may have strokes with drooping of the face. A lot of time the facial nerve may be impacted with that. Um, but I do want to talk about the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is one of the few cranial nerves that, if you damage, can actually have bad uh, repercussions for you because it sends out divisions to vital visceral organs. Unlike, you know, if you have an olfactory nerve damage, fine, you can't smell well. But if you have the vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10, sending out branches and divisions to vital organs like the heart and that gets damaged, that can be a problem. Actually, damage to the vagus nerve can be life-threatening, as Dr. V just stated, and a lot of times it is if the damage on both sides is, is present. This um, slide is just showing you a very, very important division of the peripheral nervous system. That division is called the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system, like it sounds like, it sounds like automatic. That's what it is. You cannot think about controlling this division of the nervous system. It happens automatically. Now, I know you've seen all these terms here. I'm not going to go into details with that. But the autonomic division of the peripheral, there's two um, parts to it. The first division is called parasympathetic. And then we have the sympathetic um, nervous system. The sympathetic is more of that flight or fight response where things are energized in your body, which Dr. V will talk about that in a second. And the parasympathetics are kind of like the resting or putting on the brakes as per se to bring things back down. So Dr. V, can you give some examples to talk a little bit more about the autonomic nervous system? Sure. So as a general rule of thumb, across the body, sympathetic nerves generally cause things to occur rapidly to speed things up, uh, whereas the parasympathetic nerves slow things down. Um, so let's look at the heart, for example. When you're exercising, it's the sympathetic nerves that allows your heart rate to increase, whereas the parasympathetic nerves will slow your heart rate back down. Um, that's true of just about every organ system. However, there's some uh, caveats to that. That means that the digestive system, for instance, kind of has a flip side. The parasympathetic nerves tend to have um, a higher impact on whether the digestive system functions properly or not. Reproduction is also another one that's kind of a little different. Um, as in male reproduction, you'll see that the male erection is, is caused by the parasympathetic nerves. You might have thought that would be sympathetic nerves that would do that. But the sympathetics actually cause ejaculation. So those two systems, the digestive tract and the reproductive system, 
don't follow the same pattern that you might intuitively think about. However, as a general rule of thumb, the autonomic sympathetics causes things to speed up, whereas parasympathetics slow things down. Right, so if I was to jump scare you and your heart rate is going through the roof, that would be sympathetics, right? That would be sympathetics, that's true. And then when your heart rate comes back down, when you realize that I jumped out and scared you, that would be the parasympathetics putting the brakes on the sympathetics, correct? Sure. So without getting into too much detail, this is actually a little bit more um, than just an overview. And I won't get into too much detail, but... The parasympathetic nerves are always holding back sympathetic nerves. And so only when you have a fight or flight response do the parasympathetic nerves allow the sympathetic nerves to become active. And so the parasympathetics typically controls the sympathetics. And that's why um, they slow things back down or keep things at rest. But when sympathetics are active, the parasympathetics allow them to um, become overly active because you need to in those situations. Like if a dog was chasing you, you need to run away, right? Or you need to jump a fence or get away. So that fight or flight response is solely due to sympathetic nerve responses. Okay, so it is quiz time. Let's go through and see what you know. All right, the brain and spinal cord belong to which branch of the nervous system? Is it peripheral, central, or both peripheral and central? Hopefully you picked central nervous system. Okay, so brain and spinal cord. Which neurons send impulses towards the central nervous system? So sending messages to the central nervous system. All right, is it motor neurons, sensory neurons, efferent neurons, or afferent neurons? You have to select all that applies. And if you select sensory or afferent, you're correct. They're the same thing. They're interchangeable names, and so it's not a trick question. You may see it as either or on a test or an exam or a quiz, so make sure that you know that sensory and afferent are the same. The part of the neuron that is wrapped in a sheath is called the, is it the soma, dendrites, axon, cell body, or axon terminal? Which one is wrapped in a sheath? All right, so if you said axons, you're correct. So remember, the sheath is called a myelin sheath. And depending on where it's located, you may have the oligodendrocytes or the Schwann cells forming that sheath. Okay, so this one, I mentioned it, and I was supposed to go into details with it, so I'll just talk about it now. The blank are the gaps found between the myelin sheet. Now, this part you should be able to answer. All right, so remember that I will just draw this out for you. So here is, you know, the cell body with the dendrites. Of course, it looks kind of ridiculous. Here is your axon, and here is the axon terminal end. And remember, we have um, the myelin sheet that kind of coats the axon, right? So this looks really bad. All right. All right. So there are some major gaps that we see here. Of course, this is not drawn to scale. So you see that there's a gap here and a gap here. All right. Those gaps are called nodes of Ranvier. So if you picked nodes of Ranvier, then you would be right. Now, there's um, the nodes of Ranvier are really important. So remember we have the myelin sheath that is here. The myelin sheath will actually provide kind of like a electrical insulator that will allow things to pass through. So when you have an action potential, which we'll talk about in video two, you'll have a signal that will go, but the signal will actually jump to these gaps, these nodes of Ranvier. So instead of following straight through, it will jump. That jumping is called saltatory conduction, right? So the nodes of Ranvier are important. If you did not have that, it will take a little bit longer for the message to go through. So that type of conduction or that jumping is called saltatory conduction and is found happening at the nodes of Ranvier. 
Right. So obviously the choice would be Nozaranvier and Saltadori conduction. All right. The CNS have, has both gray and white matter. Okay. So gray and white matter. Remember, gray matter versus white matter depends on whether or not a sheath is present. So true or false? The answer is true. Cranial and spinal nerves belong to which division of the nervous system? Is it peripheral, central, or both? Right, so cranial nerve and spinal nerves. If you said peripheral, you're correct. So spinal nerves actually come off of the spinal cord, but it's not a part of the spinal cord, so it's considered peripheral. Remember, the cranial nerves, they do originate at the brain stem and other parts of the brain, but they're not part they're not actually brain, so they're also considered peripheral nerves. What division of the PNS, that's peripheral nervous system, is involved in the flight response? So example, when your heart rate goes up when you're scared. Is it the sympathetic or the parasympathetic division? If you said sympathetic, you are right. Okay. The rest response is seen in which autonomic division of the peripheral nervous system? The rest response, bringing things back down, like bringing heart rate back down, bringing your breathing rate back down. Is that sympathetic or parasympathetic? If you said parasympathetic, you are right. So hopefully you got 100% on this quiz. This was just some basic things talking about the neurons, um, and talking about the different divisions of the actual nervous system. Please watch the next video that we're going to post. The next video is talking about something really critical, which is action potential. A lot of students tend to get some um, things mixed up when we're talking about action potential. But it's really critical that draws back to the sodium potassium pump and a bunch of other things. So go ahead and take a look at that. Um, we'll post it together with this one. So, But make sure you uh, leave a comment below whether or not you did okay on this quiz. Until next time, bye.